yeah, put, did I... he's in the back seat, his foot's in the front seat, like. Yeah, I almost kicked the truck, the driver on the way, on the way back to the Airbnb. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I do. Yeah, and how more, how like, to I was... win tournaments, how to I win. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the Changeable Podcast. My name is Justin Roberts, and I'm joined by Jordan McGinley. It's been a while, but today we have uh, what's supposed to be a good episode. Going to our, our good friend Chuchi Kirkman. Uh, we have UCSB legend in the building. We have his career high as 121 in the world. He's got two challenger titles. Apparently, he's a pretty good kite surfer. Nice. And his best result, I think, is beating both Jody and I back to back in the Cancun Futures. <laughs> causing me the full, <laughs> causing me the full body crap there. Uh, yeah. We have Nicolas Marino de Alboran. Thanks for joining us, bro. <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you, boys. I've been following your podcast for, for a while. And honestly, I, I really respect what you guys are doing. Um, I think it's awesome. It's awesome for the sport. It's awesome in, in general, not only, you know, in regards to tennis. Um, I really, you know, I think it's great when people start up new things. And, and yeah, I mean, it's for me, it's it's great to be here and, and to um talk on you on your guys's podcast uh, yeah. and i and i wish you both the, the very best with this um and you know that i'll be supporting along the way appreciate, appreciate it bro you remember those matches uh, the, yeah dude I was, you, of course both of you were cooking me i don't know how i won those <laughs> matches but that against you justin i remember that the rain saved me because you you broke me early in the third we were battling like it was so hot and yeah. the conditions there are crazy, man. Like, people don't know. Bro, I, I always say that yeah. you're not a tennis player if you haven't played in Cancun. <laughs> yeah, it was so hot. I, I started the full body cramping that much. I remember... Yeah, no, you started the full rain. body cramping when you, were, when you were serving for the match. Yeah. And then, and then <laughs> it started, it started uh, raining, and I was like, oh, my God, this is so lucky. And then we came back, and you couldn't, you couldn't move. You couldn't move. And no, I basically I won that actually. match because... After the match, Justin came into the little game room and just threw his bags on, like like tossed them across the room. And I'm thinking, like, don't be physical, like you're going to die. Like if you yeah. keep like being physical and yeah. throwing shit, you're actually going to die. And then he was in the taxi after we... full yeah. body cramping in the taxi. Like foot, yeah, did I... he's in the back seat, his foot's in the front seat. Like <laughs> Yeah, I almost kicked the truck, the driver on the way on the way back to the Airbnb. <laughs> oh, because you guys were staying at an Airbnb, huh? Yeah. Half an hour away. My hamstring locked up on me. So, so for me, that those two weeks were crazy because um, I had graduated, I had no points, and I graduated on a on a Saturday. Sorry, on a, on a Friday, and um, I really wanted to play, uh, and I had no option other than going to Cancun to to start my pro career. So, I took a flight on Saturday, and um, I started playing the qualies, uh, like. 20, 24 hours after I graduated, after I walked. Um, <laughs> and then the first week I, I made the final against um, Nico Mejia. Yeah. And then I started having really bad uh, like stomach cramps. I think obviously I ate something bad and I couldn't eat anything. I was just eating uh, bread for a whole week. Um, and you stayed at the site? I stayed at the site, yeah. And... I won, so so I got special exempt into the second week. Um, so I've won my first match, and then I was like, I was really bad. I had already lost like four kilos, and because I wasn't eating anything, and I asked the the I was on a, like I was mentally prepared to just be there for you know to get as many points as possible so I could enter the ones in Europe um, later on in the summer, and and I told the the supervisor I was like, put me in I don't know what court number it was, but it was like next to the building. Because there was a bathroom. Give it a shade. As, oh, the bathroom. No, no, no. There was a there was a bathroom close to the court. So from the sec, I ended up losing in semis. I can't remember against who, but um, on the on the changeovers, I would go to the bathroom, and I would come back. And that that happened. That's definitely week. not allowed. This man's just making up rules. Oh, I'm allowed to. Stay. I'm allowed to I'm allowed to no, no, I was allowed. I t I asked the referee, and he said, as long as you're doing it. It, it, within the 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 time the minute, you're fine the 90 seconds yeah, yeah. Or yeah yeah and and i was just going it was like like 10 meters away and i was going there and back all the way up until semis and then and semis i was like dude i can't stay here for another week i i, I got back to to madrid because i didn't have a place to stay 
and and I went to the doctor and I had this disease and I I was like sick for like I don't know like two weeks without eating it properly. So wait, this um this was the you played us the second week. No, no, I played you guys the first week. Oh, I was about to say this man's cooking us and uh, yeah, <laughs> that, no, that, no, that would have been embarrassing. Uh, that would have hurt. That hurt a little bit more. Hey, but Justin, I'm, I'm one on one. I'm one on one. Yeah, no? I'm. I'm yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna start with a little a little game. Uh, I'm gonna give you some topics, and we're gonna say if they're over or underrated, and we're gonna explain why and see if we agree. So the first one: traveling with a coach, over or underrated? Uh, underrated. Underrated. Why? I think nowadays the tennis is so professional that you know you you wanna like. And I've been there. I've, I've, I traveled without a coach. Um, and I've also, and now I travel with a coach. But tennis is too, the game has evolved too much for, for you to be able to do everything on your own. You know, I remember my, yes. my college coach telling me, you know, back in the day, people used to train together and be like, yeah, just serve at me and I'll practice my returns and then I'll serve at you. You practice your returns. It was, it was way more simple. Now, a lot more people, play different ways you know like i feel mm -hmm. like back in the t back in you know 30 years ago there's a lot more serving volleying now you know you see medvedev playing a certain style you see you know nadal playing a certain style alcaraz playing a certain style so you gotta a coach really helps you to um you know develop your game you know which is very mm -hmm. different to anyone else's and i feel like you know that's the beauty of the game i feel like people now are 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 more um you know they're they're more diverse in the way they play and yeah. you know a coach allows you to work on those things obviously we all know you know we don't, i don't have to say it again but our sport is you know the the price money is skewed to the towards the top um of the ranking so um it's very tough like if you're playing futures and even challengers to to travel with a coach um, every week but uh, having said that I think you know I wouldn't say it's underrated because I feel like people do appreciate it but you know um, I think it's still underrated I think people uh, really benefit or players really benefit from having a coach I think yeah. not just in like preparing for matches but also let's say you lose early in a week and you have five six days for your next match I think Getting those days to count and not kind of waste them and just hitting balls kind of mindlessly. I think having a of coach on the road helps so much with that. Yeah. And also, and also, I feel like not only that, but um, you know, you want to play as much as possible. But certain players like me, I put myself in that category. I need to be fed balls, you know, and I need to be mm -hmm. served at. Like, imagine if we were at a at a at a tournament together. I'm not gonna be like. Yo, Justin, can you serve 120 serves at me? You know what I mean? Because yeah. uh, you're gonna <laughs> blow out your shoulder. You know, like For sure. so. So like, I I I definitely benefit from coaches, and I'm I'm very lucky to have a, a in my opinion, a very good coach. He's one of my best friends as well, and um, uh, he's helped me tremendously, and and I'm very grateful for for you know the effort he puts in, um, because without him, I would for sure not be in the position I am today. You know. Um, sure. Before we okay. continue this discussion, we um about your coach now. How long have you been working with, with this coach? Since I was eleven. Okay, because yeah, I, I guess so... one of the notes that we had to talk about today was your relationship with this coach. Like, what I guess can you give us a little bit of history behind um behind this yeah. and and how you guys so like how come it's so I... important for you to keep working with him now? Yeah, I grew up in the Dominican Republic, and um, as Justin said before, I used to compete in sailing and, and didn't really take tennis too seriously other than just, you know, as a hobby playing, you know, every day just in the local courts. But then I moved to England, and that's when, obviously, sailing is pretty tough to do in London. Um, and so <laughs> uh, I started playing more tennis and, and football as well. I mean, soccer um, and rugby. Uh, did some um, track and field as well. Someone but played really, everything. Yeah, just but just you know, not even at like a, a high level. I mean, 
with soccer. I, I the, 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 in the Dos Equis guy, the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> um, it must be a UCSB thing because Simon was saying some crazy shit in his episode yeah, so I go, couldn't believe oh, yeah, yeah. Was Simon, yeah. <laughs> um, but then you know I started um, so how I met this my coach was um, people used to didn't want me to play in uh, in their sessions here uh, in the group sessions at, at the clubs in London they said that I was uh, really bad and that I didn't have the level to join their their squad you know um yeah. so so i was just kind of grinding around different clubs uh uh trying to you know join a um a squad where i could play with other players and then i was at this place called duke's meadows which is basically like a pay and play and um uh this guy rolled in and i remember i was playing with a different player and uh he came up to me and said hey i just met uh your dad outside and uh, we arranged to have a, a a session on Thursday. It was like a Monday, and I'm like, "Oh, okay, nice." And so, I, I, my dad picked me up. I was like 11, 12 years old. My dad picked me up. I told him, "Yo, this guy came up to me. Like, he looks so bad. Like, who is this guy? He wants to give me a session on Thursday? This guy is, looks horrible." So then we we're talking about it at home when I got home, and my older brother was like, "Fine, don't worry, I'll I'll go." um i'll do the session and so it came thursday comes around and you know my brother comes back with blisters everywhere in the hand um and just like drenched in sweat and i'm like yo what happened and he's like dude because both of my brothers i have an older one and i'm a, and a younger one they both played tennis pretty well but they never uh really liked the competitive side but they're they're very good and my older brother was like dude this was the best session ever like this guy is good and I was like, okay, I'm going next session. And my brother was like, nah, you can't do that. You know, you, you said from the get-go that you weren't, you thought this guy was bad. So anyways, like a couple of weeks later, I convinced my brother to take his spot. And ever since I've just been working with, with him. Um, and he's, he's great. I mean, I'm very, as I said before, I'm very grateful for, for what he's uh, taught me both on and off the court. And I think we have a really good relationship. Um, there's a lot of honesty between us, a lot of transparency. Um, and I think both of us are very obsessed with, with getting better, you know, and um, one of the most important things is to see the game in a similar way. And that doesn't mean identical. Like, obviously we have our differences, but in general, we see it pretty similar and we, we agree on, on at least on how my tennis should be played. Um, and then, we we really like talking tennis and and yeah it's it's great i have a lot of respect for for these kind of coaches that like i don't know they commit to a project because it's risky for you as a player on your own but then imagine how risky it is for for like him to buy into your project and coach you for all these years and stay loyal and all this stuff and not try to pursue something else that maybe i don't know like if they had a a home base in the academy or they do group sessions or they get some sort of other coaching role they can make a lot more money so it's just as risky for these kind of coaches um to pursue this project with you than it is for you to to, to pursue it you know what i mean so i don't know i have course, a lot yeah. of respect for these kind of coaches yeah yeah no absolutely and like now he has two young uh kids uh one's like three i think and the other the girl is like four months old and he's still traveling with me and, and, you know, I, it's just incredible to see his commitment and, and it's very tough for him to be, you know, at the end of the day, I'm the one playing, but he's obviously has a big role in my, in my career, but, um, you know, to leave your family and to travel, uh, and you know how traveling tennis travels are, it's chaotic, dude. Yeah. So to, to do that, I have there's a lot of respect, but in, in general, I think I've been very lucky with, with, uh, with the coaches that I've had. Um, my coaches at Santa Barbara, I'm, I'm, I can't say enough good things about them. Um, Marty Davis, Blake Muller and Jeff Crosby. Um, they, they really helped me develop. Um, I mean, that's the only reason or the main reason why I chose Santa Barbara. I think the coaching staff there for me was perfect. I have nothing bad to say. I think they they know so much about 
developing a player and and you know I always say that in Santa Barbara I felt like each player was a program you know um didn't matter where you played in the lineup and didn't matter how you played they always you know changed their approach just to get the the, the best out of you um I mean and to this day I still talk to them every day and I talk tactics to them and you know I asked for their opinion and Marty Davis for example he still does weeks with me um throughout the year and um you know he sends me scouting reports on, on the players that I'm playing That's cool. uh, every single week so I've, I've I've definitely been very lucky and and I always say that if I wasn't for if it wasn't for the coaches that I've had I wouldn't I wouldn't be here you know, I, I owe it to them as much as I owe it to myself and I and yeah. my fitness coach and physio. You know, it's a, it's a team it's a team thing for sure. The coach definitely underrated. We're going to go with underrated on that one. Yes. <laughs> Wait, let me say one more thing about it. Let me say one more thing about it. Um, I agree also, especially now because um, you're allowed to be coached during matches now too. So now it becomes even more valuable that a coach can actually they're allowed to coach. Like they were coaching anyway, but now they're allowed to coach. You know, so then yeah. even now it's even more, I think, even more important. And then it just you don't before I feel like people used to train at their bases and then go out and play tournaments and then come back and train and go out and play tournaments. But if you have a coach on the road, the training doesn't stop. You know, like the progression doesn't really stop. Like you play matches and then you can still go and put in work. So yeah, yeah I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Next. All right, we got one we got another one. The next one is the pre match hit. Overrated, underrated. I was just gonna say something about coaches with the pre match hit. Like in my opinion, it's a little training session. Like for me, there is not a, a single pre match route uh, hit that is identical to the previous one. Um, okay. Like obviously, uh, I have a physical warm up that I you know I have and 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 I follow a certain routine. But in terms of the you know the thirty minutes that we do of, of hitting, for me, it's every every time I it's something different, and and really? in. With my coach, we have this, you know, philosophy that it's it's an opportunity to work on something for five, ten minutes that you need to work a bit more on, you know? Mm -hmm. And and if you do that every day, like if you do that five, ten minutes every day, then at the end of the month, it's it's a lot of time you've worked on it, you know? So like, you know, there's days where we'll spend more time on serving. And but on a specific serve, you know, like make sure this kick it goes bounces left to right and, and it's cutting the sideline or whatever. Um, Does that depend on the game. opponent you play, or is that just you just pick something? Yeah, I guess I guess that I guess it depends on the opponent. But in my in 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 how we do it, it's just based on us. Um, whether or not you're going to use that more or less on in, in that match you have that day. You know, depends on the opponent, but I think we try and focus and just keep developing our our game. You know, right. like there was this there was this time where my coach was obsessed with me improving my volleys, and and he was just like just on my case with the technique. You know, and like in 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 the warm ups, um, he would be like one more, one more back end. I want to see one more back end, one more back end volley, one more back end volley, one more low back end volley, one more high back end volley, and. You know, whether just instead of just going like and just warming up your volleys, like he really wanted me to work in a specific volley for, you know, five more minutes than than the other stuff, you know. So at the end of the month, I really felt like that back in volley was was pretty good um, for my for my standards and for myself, you know. That's interesting. That's the first time that I heard of it that in that detail, because I would say it's the other way around. Like I would say for me. Like, and this is why, I mean, I'm understanding that it's every person is different because for me, it's too easy for me to slip into like a practice mentality, like practice mindset. And that carries over into the match. And then in the match, maybe I'm thinking about improving instead of just competing. So for me recently, like, especially with how much tennis we play, I've tried to almost let go a little bit and just be loose and calm and just get the body going. Like, yeah, no. sometimes I I would warm up like absolute shit, and then the match starts. And so now I like disregard how the warm up was, and I played great. You know, so yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Um, I kind of just separate it. I just think of it as a warm up. You're just gonna hit some balls and and loosen up, and then it's completely separate to what's gonna happen. Like once once you start playing. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, everyone's different, and I know players are like, oh no, I have to hit one more uh, slicer. Like it has to be perfect. Like, or I have to hit two serves to each spot without missing. Or I don't know. Like, there's very <laughs> there's everyone's different, but it's what works for you. You know. Um. And for me, just like it, it also, I think takes pressure off the match, you know, because if you take it as like a training session, you kind of just like loosening up and you're not giving anything that much more importance. You know, you're just working on something because you know that the next day you're going to work on something different or the same. So yeah. you're just like, and obviously you warm up everything, you know, you do, I like to do the crosses down the middles you know, certain things, certain shots that I'd like to work on. I sometimes want to get fed a couple balls, um, but everyone's different and, and there's no right or wrong. I think it's just what works best for you. Yeah. Do you ever end on a miss or you have to hit the last ball in? I don't even, I don't even think about that. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, um, how, how do I say, um, uh, when you are, um, damn, what's the word, dude? Like, Okay, Spanish is the first language. <laughs> indifferent, is indifferent. No, no, maybe? no, no. Like, like. Oh, I gotta wear these socks because it's good luck. Uh, what's oh, that superstitious. word? Superstitious. Superstitious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am, I am pretty superstitious, but like in terms of missing, uh, finishing on a, on a, on a miss or not, I don't, I don't really think about that. You, Justin, you have to end on a make. No. Uh, oh, Justin. Justin um. Yeah. No. No, I don't have okay. to. I don't have to. But I feel like that for me is because I don't want to be superstitious. I don't like the idea. Yeah, of you're forcing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. I I want to have more faith in my abilities than like, if this one thing doesn't happen, then the whole day falls apart. I don't you really like have, that. You want to have more faith with with the movement, moving side to side yeah, yeah. with those with those legs of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. So we're gonna go what? So for you, it's underrated. So that's pretty much it. Like it's a big deal for you. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I would say it's. Uh. Yeah. I would say it's fairly important. Yeah. Yeah. I got another one for you. College teams being loud and animated. I remember when I was at school, it was like a big emphasis on the rah rah and the the supporting and the. You think that that's overrated or underrated? No, I think that uh underrated or overrated um i just think it's different to pro you know but i i think it's it's underrated the effect that it has you know i okay. think it's just like all that positive energy from a team is 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 so important and you know that's you can feel it some, on the other side yeah you can feel it on the other side but you can also feel it in your own side you know when you have uh, like seven guys cheering for you you're that much more positive and, and you're not really, you know, thinking of losing or you're not thinking of um, not competing or getting angry with yourself. You're just like trying to give the best because you got all those guys cheering for you, you know? Um, yeah. So I would say it's underrated. I think it's great for, for tennis. Obviously, you know, college can get out of hand a bit. Um, in, I, where I've felt felt to the most is in, in Paris playing the French Open and in Italy like the crowds are just incredible I think it's obviously a lot to do with the um you know the betting but like okay. I've played it I've, I've played Italians I've played Italians in Italy and they're cheering for me you know it's just like <laughs> what's, go, what's going on here you know and then something's not I'm, right here yeah it's not right 365 right now <laughs> yeah, I've I've played I've played Italians, it, I've I played against Italians in Italy, and they've gone against me, and it's it's hell. But um, you know, coming from college, you're kind of used to it, and I personally like it because I, I'm pretty good at putting all those things to the side. Um, mm. but I'm like I remember my first challenger final in, in Ecuador in Salinas. I played uh Gomez. He's from he's from Ecuador, and yeah. We played at night and there were so many drunk people and um, just a packed place. And I had, um, I think I had like three match points. I was five, two up serving in the third, serving for the match. Like I had a sh bunch of chances 
and I ended up losing the match. But after I was like, wow, man, that must have been so special for him. You know, like I'm mm-hmm. so I'm so happy for him that he had to, that he was able to live that, you know, and and in my opinion, um, tennis, like everything it takes from you also gives, you, you know, um, yeah. I'm, I'm a firm believer that all the bad luck that you get against against you, like, quote unquote, um, like nets or whatever, or matches you've lost with match points. You, you, at some point during the season and in, in your career, if you keep going, you're gonna get you're gonna get those back, you know. And I've I've oh, had that. my, Go ahead. Sorry. I've I've had my like my matches too. I remember qualifying for the for the U.S. Open last year, the last round against Delore. Like it was it was insane. Like just experiencing that atmosphere i saved match points i was five love down in the championship tie break um in the third set and and i got through it and obviously in my opinion i i feel like those moments aren't under your control they're just like moments things that happen you know and and i was just so it was an incredible moment for me so when i lost that final in selena's i was just like Obviously, I'm super bummed, and in that moment, I'm just like, I, I, I can't even believe it. But I was so happy for 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 him and for, you know, seeing how he, um, experienced that in his hometown or home soil, in front of his family, in front of his dad. That's so special. Like, and as a as a as a sports person, like, you know, I I live to see those moments, whether they're against. Me. I mean that's why you play. That's a good like, way always, to flip the perspective. You always dream of playing in front of, like a lot of people, whether they're for you or against you. Like, that's that's when you're a little kid. That's what you dreamed of, you know, like playing in front of crowds and stadiums and that sort of stuff. So, I mean, I obviously it's not the same as playing a challenge or final, but like when I'm playing in Mexico against Mexicans and there's 200, 300 people cheering against me, I felt the same way, you know, like, and I was gonna say this about the um, underrated or overrated. Like the same impact that the crowd had with you in in Ecuador is like imagine the impact that that your teammates have on the opponent when you're playing in college, you know. So I would say course, also yeah. underrated because maybe it's giving you energy, but it's also putting thoughts into the opponent's head as well, which is probably ninety five percent of why people make noise. A hundred percent, yeah. And but I feel like when you go to college, you're already like, um, you already think. And you already accept that you're going to be put in those positions, you know, yeah. whether it's playing at home or when you're playing your rivals, you know, they're going to get rowdy and you just accept it. You know, people accept it. So like, I feel like that's one of the the, the best things that I've learned from, from playing in college. And, you know, I, you can see on tour, like players that have gone through college, they never get, they never get really fussed about a lot of, people yeah. and people cheering for them or against them you know because yeah. they've lived they've they've gone through it and um yeah you're you just accept it it's yeah. true i think even in practice like i've been on let's say good teams when it comes to support and bad teams and there are days in the week where you come to you like want a to name those teams? And this day can go do you want to name those teams no. Okay. <laughs> the the day can the day can either go left or right. Like uh, you get really pissed in practice. Maybe you're gonna start tanking for ten minutes or whatever. And I've been on teams where you have guys that really push you, and you kind of overcome those little humps. And instead of having, let's say, a week full of five good practice days, maybe you end up having only like three because you allowed yourself to get down or whatever. So I think it's probably yeah. underrated when you have such like genuine support and like like good, I guess, good vibes and good. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know you guys are pushing each other in the right way. I think it, it's definitely a, a big help. Yeah, sure. abs- absolutely, absolutely. Maybe you get some of that I got one more. this week at Davis Cup, Justin. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> Hopefully, I got. Yeah, I got one more. This one is a little different. We're gonna rank a, a scenario, and we're gonna go one, two, three. Which order you would rather have than us? Um. So yesterday I was on a on a flight for six hours, and I was. In row 34D. And I thought, okay, I got an aisle. It's not too bad. As I'm making my way to the back of the plane, 34D is the last row. I'm sitting in the toilet. So I want to know 
Would you rather have? But were you fly flying to Bahamas? Was like, were you flying to Bahamas? I was flying from from Panama. No, no, no. I was flying from Panama City to Asuncion, Paraguay. Oh, okay. So we had about six and a half hours. So, would you rather have the last row where you can't recline and you sit by the toilet in the aisle? The last row you you sit by the toilet in the window. Or would you rather have a middle seat? But you're in an exit row, your little leg room. Uh, I would say I would say uh, window, like leaning leaning against the window. It, I've, yeah. it's so much easier than sleeping like in the middle. You know what I mean? Yeah, because uh, the handrest too. The handrest in the middle is just half the time I'm sitting like this in the middle. Yeah, bro. The issue, bro. I can sleep anywhere, right? But when I sat. In the aisle seat by the toilet, there's a constant line, and oh, yeah. I'm I'm not the skinniest person. So every time the flight attendant walked past, he bumped my shoulder. A lady came out of the bathroom and used my shoulder as like a as a as a thing to hold herself up to get out of the bathroom and not fall over. Like yeah, that's crazy. People walk in it with their bare feet into the toilet, and then a woman throw it up. Like I couldn't sleep. Like I have six but, hours up. But that's get, that's a you gotta you gotta knock the button. You gotta tell the 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 uh, Bahamas Davis Cup captain that you should yeah, be going in business. Say, yeah, you're exactly. Right, bro. Yeah, for business class. Put me up right front. <laughs> oh man, bro, it was rough. I'm telling, I'm, I'm telling the Antigua go. Tennis Association, throw me up front. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm. I think for life now, I gotta go. I gotta go window. I hate being. Yeah. Also, I hate being asked yeah. asked to wake up or get up to, to go to the bathroom. Normally, I just sit the whole flight and I just sit in the window and just don't bother. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I think that that's I think that's the way to go. Thanks. Yeah. Where are you at now, bro? Tell um, me where you are? Currently, I'm in I'm in London. Um, I'm preparing for Wimbledon. Um, I wanted I played one tournament in Holland last week. Um, the two fifty, I lost first round qualies. Against Brower, he he's he played well. He's he's good on on um, on grass, and um, yeah, I mean I've been playing a bunch, so I wanted to take some couple couple weeks off um, and work on my fitness a bit because after Wimbledon or starting from Wimbledon, I don't think I'm going to stop until the end of the U.S. Open. Um, no. So you know, having these two weeks of of training block and also here in London my coach is from London uh so um he's got good connections here good good training sessions lined up um on grass so um yeah I'll be here preparing for that and then after Wimbledon I'll, I'll be playing around Europe on clay I'll do a mixture of um uh the 250s um and the challengers and then I think I'll go to the US around Washington uh, for the 500 um, and then I'll stay there up until the US Open um, yeah. but I mean last year I did the I went to the US a bit earlier and I played on hard but um, you know I don't I don't really have a preference I think I play well on both um, but since I played uh, well on clay this year and and I've been playing on clay I think it was a good decision to just stay here a bit longer in Europe and and you know having a good mixture of atp tournaments and, and challengers um mm-hmm. and hopefully you know crack the top 100 that's it's my goal and and i really want to i feel like uh i definitely feel i can do it obviously but um i just need i think that i need the couple things to align a bit better and and mm-hmm. and i'll and i'll achieve it um so that's that's the plan up until the U S open. Um, yeah. I don't really know what I'm going to do after the U S open. I think it really depends on, on your ranking, whether you're top hundred or you're top one twenty or you're worse. Um, but we'll see when, when we get there. Uh, but that's kind of the idea up until then. How's the grass? Do you like, bro, talk you to like me that? about, yeah, oh, sorry, go on. My bad brother. No, I was going to say, talk to me about grass because I think you and I play kind of similar. So like, like to use the kick and like instead of forehand, like how does the grass take the spins you like to play with? Does it affect how you need to play, or like how do you kind of adjust to the to the surface? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I personally believe that adapting to a, a surface or a different surface is all about the attitude. Like, if you want to mm -hmm. play well on that surface, then you will most likely, you know, do well. Um, obviously, not always, you know, you know how tennis goes. But if you have the right mindset, then you will improve on that surface. And at some point, you'll get the result you want. Um, so I think it's just about the mentality because at the end of the day, you're a good tennis player. So it, it doesn't, it's not like you're playing a different sport. You're just playing on a different mm -hmm. surface, you know? So it's adapting your game to what you can do well on that surface. And for me, like when, when I play on hard courts, fast, hard courts or fast, uh, grass courts, then I use more of my serve. Um, and I try and, you know, um, focus on on the serve and first shot uh when i play on slower surfaces it gives me the chance to you know use my forehand with a bit more time um the i try and hit my my forehand a bit heavier on grass i try and hit my forehand uh to go through a bit more um and yeah as i said it's it's about seeing the things that you do well and then just mm. redirecting it to the surface but i think everyone can play well on, on everything. It's just, it's just a mindset, you know, like yeah, to put an example of, of one of the, you know, an example that everyone can, can relate to or can see is Medvedev, you know, you three, four years ago, you see him complaining of, of playing on hard and, and throwing tantrums in court during a clay court match. Sorry, sorry. I, I said, I, I think clay. I said hard. I meant, I meant yeah, clay. I meant clay. Um, mm. And then last year you go and see, you see him win a master's. You know, how many people yeah. have won Rome? Like, not a lot of people, you know? So, um, uh, the fact that he he wanted to win and he wanted to play well obviously gave him the result. Yeah, he, did, he didn't do that good at French Open. Um, and, of course, clay isn't his best surface, but that doesn't mean you can do, you can do well, at, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> he still got a good result on, on clay. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, like, I was... Yeah. I was talking to Kovacevic about, about the grass, and he said for his feeling, he doesn't take the spins that, that well. Like, he felt like his slight surface didn't curl as much. They just kind of died. You have the same feeling, or is it? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, everyone says, that everyone thinks it's fast. It's not that fast. It just mm -hmm. doesn't bounce much, but it's not that fast. Okay. Obviously, like, if you play early in the morning, it's a bit more damp and it skids more. But other than that, okay. it's not that it's not that fast. It's, it just doesn't bounce as much. So um, I think the yeah, I can agree with with Kova like on on certain uh, courts. You know, I feel like also sometimes you're like, why isn't my serve moving? You know, but then I've mm -hmm. I've also felt other times where you're just like, okay, I feel like Pete Sampras right now. You know, my my serve is okay. moving, <laughs> moving like crazy. So it depends. It, de it depends on the on the court, but. Um, uh, I think the most important with the grass is the composure, you know, and and mm. and really like trying to make balls um, in awkward positions. Obviously, if you have it there and, and it's sitting, you got to hit it. And I personally don't want it to come back. That's but that's my game, you know. And then you don't want to come in and hit back on volleys. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> if I can, if I can, a high one, I a can, low one. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It's better for it not to come back. But obviously that's more risky and you and, and, and you miss more. But um, you know, for me, my mentality is I I'll I'll hit my forehand every day of the week and sometimes we'll go in, sometimes it doesn't, but I'll I'll die uh, you know, using my 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 weapons. So yeah. um yeah, but the composure on grass, you know, you're like moving around and you're playing defense and you go, you will have to use a forehand slice, you'll have to slice for the backhand. And then you have some bad bounces, obviously, where you you got to make them, you know, just, just make it on the other side and see and ask the question. Um, I think that's 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 key. Apart from the grass, like when you're playing, how how tactical are you, and how much are you just focusing on your own your own strengths and your own patterns? Because yeah, that's... this year we watched the Miami Open, and we were watching Casper play, play against I think Luca Van Ash and. The guy seemed to have like a pretty, pretty good flat backhand, and it was wasn't like he was giving up too much ground. But Casper didn't do much of attacking to the other side. He still kind of stayed with his inside out pattern. 
and eventually he just edged the guy out in the third set and he just kind of stayed what he's good at. Do you yeah. think about that? Do you adjust the opponents or do you kind of just go with what's, what works for you? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, and it's a question that, that my coach and I ask almost every week, you know, because um, there's been there's been times where I've been he doesn't too know. tactic. <laughs> there, there's been there's been times where I've been too tactical in terms of like what should yeah. we do with this guy, you know, like focusing in a lot a lot on him. And then you realize yeah. like you're not doing anything, you know, yeah. of your own stuff. And then there's other times where you feel like you're playing really well because you're you're using your strengths, but you're not really hurting the other guy because you know, uh, maybe with those patterns of play, the matchup, guy, yeah, yeah, the matchup. So we've come to the conclusion that, um, and this this is what works for me that at the beginning of a tournament when you get to a tournament, um, because every place is different, um, we try and focus slightly more on ourselves. Um, and then if we can get past the first couple rounds, then I already know, or it's in, it's it's embedded in me what is working in that condition on those courts, mm-hmm. on that surface, you know, that particular week. And then we can re- we can start talking more about the player. So, like That's for example, guy. we go we go to a tournament, and the and the first round will be like, look, you do, you're you're good at this, you're good at that. Let's try and keep using that favorite serve. And then, but just just bear in mind that he has a good forehand return. All right, sounds good. We go, we win. The second round would be kind of like similar similar talk. And then by quarters, you're like, all right, this guy is, he's been doing this really well. And we'll look at what he, the other guy's been doing well that week. You know, uh, he has mm-hmm. a really good flat back end or he, uh, he comes in a lot or he uses the drop shot a lot um, because you already kind of know what you've been doing well to get to that point so yeah um yeah that's that's what i do yeah Yeah, and how how to win tournaments how to win (laughs) 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 and and when it comes to let's say mixing up plays i was i was playing a practice set with kova last week and he broke me early and we said i need to be more aware of what's going on because in the game i had hit Two seconds served to his backhand, and he missed both returns. And then I was down break point, and I felt like he knew I was going to go there. So I switched, and I went to his forehand, and he he, played he forehand clocked deep, it. And then, and then it, yeah. So he was saying that I shouldn't be so, like, give so much respect to the other guys. So, like, even if they know it's going to happen, if they haven't shown you that they can, if they haven't shown that they can, um, let's say, beat your pattern, don't go yeah. away from it. Just, don't just change it, hammer yeah. away at it. Are you good at that, or is that something that you struggle with at all? No, no. I th- I think I've obviously I've tr- struggled with it, um, but I think it's something that I've really focused on in the in recent years. I would say, um, because I consider my serve to be one of my biggest strengths. So there have been times where I've been serving to a specific spot, like mm-hmm. um, constantly, and then you're kind of just training the other guy, you know. So by the tenth time you hit it there, the guy's just yeah. you've you've just trained him. But what I feel like the something to bear in mind is like each spot has a different serve, a different speed, and a different um uh, like spin. Yeah. So like you can go T flat, you can go T shape, you can go T kick, and they're all different mm-hmm. serves. And but you're still going to that guy's. Um, side, you know, you're still going to, in this case, COVID's back end, you know. So, like, yeah. there's a lot of times where, for example, I'll be like, okay, I just, um, I just went flat both times on the do side to the T. Um, let me just go a slower one. So then the other guy sees that it's coming T and he and he thinks it's a flat, but then the ball doesn't end up reaching him because you just slowed the serve down and then you know, you either get a mistake or a short ball. So playing around with uh, the different spins and and, and um, speeds, uh, speeds is, I think is very important. And I call it for myself, I, I always remind my, myself by saying, imagine you're a pitcher. Imagine you, you got the pitching mentality because at the end of the day, the, the, the baseball, in baseball, the pitchers have that, you know, that square. It's not, it's not as, they don't have as many options 
as we do in terms of like where you're hitting your serves, but they still yeah. mix it up really well. You know, they'll hit a, they'll hit a fastball or they'll hit a dipper or whatever. And you just got to bear that in mind and just be like, okay, just keep mixing it up in terms of all those different uh, mm-hmm. scenarios. I think also you have to play the score too a little bit. Like, I mean, I've been playing more doubles now than singles recently, but I think about that, like maybe if you gave people the same look and you're up big in the game, 30 love, 40 love or something, maybe not 30 love, but especially 40 love, 40 15s, maybe now you can change, change, give him a different look, like, so that he doesn't think every single time you're going to go the same serve, same serve, same serve. So you can also play the score. Like when there's not that much pressure on you in a game, then you can change it up and give him something to make him think. You know what I mean? I believe you have to play yeah. the score too. A hundred percent. Or like in, in Justin's scenario, what he just said, like it's break point. Then just ask Kova the question, you know, like yeah. can he, can he, can he clock that? back in return on break point will he hit a good yeah. back in return on break point and if he does then obviously you know too good yeah i feel it. like in that situation <laughs> <laughs> but i feel like in that situation if he's missed it both times the chance of him like really going for it the third time is going to be pretty low if anything he's going to be a little bit more tentative more like let me make this ball and then worst case yeah. you have a yeah. forehand yeah and then we spoke yeah. about it at that changeover and then the rest of the set i was pretty I was pretty comfortable just going there again and again. I actually was holding serve a lot easier. So I guess it's not always like black and white in tennis, you know, like there's no one answer, but I think you definitely got to keep those things in mind when it comes to tactics and mixing things up. Yeah. Shout out to Coach Kova. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you had an interesting time at UCLA, just like with Djokovic, no? You spent yeah, the time was... training with him? Yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was basically uh, I lost early in Cabo, and um, I my brother lives my older brother lives in LA, so I went there and I I had like two weeks until um, Indian Wells, so mm-hmm. um, I know Kova's agent because he's Spanish and he I think I posted a story on my Instagram and he and he texted me saying Yo, are you in, are you in LA? Would you like to hit with with Novak? And I was like, Yeah, of course. <laughs> And then um, <laughs> you shouldn't have asked. You should have just told me you're hitting with Novak tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, honestly. And then I don't know how someone. Oh yeah, the USDA contacted me. Um, that Rafa was in in Indian Wells, like because he was he was preparing the um, the this the Netflix event with uh, with Carlos in oh, in, Carlos. in Vegas. So I practiced with uh rafa like sunday monday and then i practiced with uh novak tuesday wednesday and then i went to indian wells i was like okay that's a pretty good preparation and you practice <laughs> with fed friday saturday yeah <laughs> it was it was crazy <laughs> um but yeah Any, it was a good hit. anything you picked up from them yeah for novak it was crazy like how like having him in front I felt like he wasn't doing it. I think, you know, like he just, he mm-hmm. just like, he didn't seem really physical. He didn't, he wasn't grunting, but then his ball was like so heavy in terms of the depth he was playing with. And like, mm-hmm. you, I always felt like I, I was the one kind of like trying to save the balls, you know, like, you know, when they, they hit, uh, good returns to your feet and you're just like oh shit mm-hmm. like I just gotta save this well that's how I felt like we were doing cross courts and we were like you know the typical two cross one line and he was just playing like a foot from the baseline on every shot so I never had the chance to like really you know load and hit it you know because he was playing mm-hmm. with so much depth that you were kind of like just eating every single ball kind of did that um, caused your quality to go down, like your quality of shot yeah, to go down, yeah. or it was just that you just couldn't attack? No, no, my quality went down because you know, I I was like, okay, let me go back a bit more, you know, because he's hitting with so much depth. Let me go back, but then the ball doesn't bounce as much because he's playing with a lot of speed and it's it it's not like going not up and down as much. Yeah. yeah. So so like then the ball wouldn't pop up and it would be like even lower, and so. 
you basically have to stay in that position and just, I guess, have talent. <laughs> was it? <laughs> you just have to be better. A- yeah. Uh, I, I say that a lot. Like, with my coach, um, like, I, I like to be humble and <laughs> with myself. And, 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 sorry. What? Sorry? No, I think the uh, I think there was a delay. No, no, sorry. Oh, okay. The, it's it froze. It froze for me. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. No, I was yeah. I was saying that with my um, oh, yeah. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Good. Um, with my coach, we always yeah, okay, like, He'll see me. He'll see me um do something, uh, and obviously get it wrong. Like what happened there? And I look at him. I go, dude, la- lack of time. Like I have no explanation. You know, just. <laughs> Like a town. <laughs> and then how different right. was Rafa? Rafa was like... Ripping you know, you know. Rafa, um, look, the guy is, the guy is super intense. Um, obviously, he's been probably one of my favorite players, so I've, I've watched him practice a lot. But it was incredible for me to see how... I kid you not, there were, bo- there were forehands he would hit so far out and then there were four hands that he would hit like i wouldn't say bottom of the net but like pretty far down the net you know like middle of the net where you're just like dude that was no way near in you know and the guy just like doesn't even think about it he just kind of like he yeah he, he just keeps hitting them and obviously you know i'm just saying those examples but there was thousands of times where he just ripping forehands and back and then they're going you know perfectly in or like a foot uh inside the baseline or opening up the court but for me it was like wow a guy that is that has won so much and he's missing by by that much like Novak would have missed uh, a lot of yeah. balls you know and Rafa was just like missing a bunch and he wasn't like phased about it he was just I guess he's just training you know and I heard for this me, about like, him. Is it is it true that he like rips even more in practice than he does in matches? You think? Yeah, yeah. I would say he just yeah he he goes all out and <laughs> like I think I'm way more relatable to Rafa than than Novak. Like for me, it's all about reps and and like really working on your on your game, you know. And there's times in practice where I've done the same, where I've like. Them. it's crazy that I've been playing tennis for almost 26 years and I just keep missing that, you know? Um, but I just keep going for it. And, and I feel like that's way more of my mentality. Um, and of course, you know, Rafa has had a lot to do with that because I've watched him so much uh, throughout the years that I've just been like, look, he just, he just missed the ball and, and he doesn't, doesn't really care, you know? Yeah. You speak a lot about like attitude and mentality, and I seen like you work hard on the fitness. But like, what are you doing to work on your on on your mental training? You have a training like uh, like a psychologist, or you're just kind of reading books, or what is kind of your approach to the mental side of the game? Yeah, I think I'm. I've been working with a psychologist for with the one that I'm working now for like a year, um, and I think mentally it's really important to meditate visualize and be at peace with yourself um i think those are the biggest obviously with my psychologist you know the the in-between point routines and pre-match routines and post-match routines they're all important but i think mentally you know rest is incredibly important um when i'm at my best mentally is when i feel rested when i feel sharp so like I take my sleep pretty seriously. Um, I try and get as many hours in as possible. Like I don't even go for eight. Like if I can get 10, I'll get 10, you know, there's no 10 hours. You can see 10 hours. I don't, I don't, I have, it's been a while since I've slept 10 hours, but what I'm saying is like, if, if I'm, if I can, I I will, you know, listen, Um, bro, just listen. (laughs) Um, (laughs) and then, and then like meditating in terms of, uh, I think meditation really helps me with my focus um, to be focused on a, on a thing for a prolonged period of time. I think it's incredibly important um, because, you know, like Roger said in his, 
in a speech the other day in college, I saw it throughout the social media. I was like, um, you know, you can be very good for two hours, but can you be good for three hours? You know, so you can play a good set, but that's not going to get you anything, you know? So for me, like yeah. meditation really helps me in, in, in terms of like, uh, keeping the focus on on a, on a, on a certain thing. Um, I obviously take my take my mind to a specific place that I've been to, or like even an object. You know, I just like think of a water bottle, and I just try and think of that for a bunch of of time. And then um, the how med- long do you take for? If I, if I may ask, uh, you know, I don't have a real, I don't have an answer. I think it what I try and do is what feels good, you know? Okay. Um, that's what my psychologist tells me. And the, the, the biggest thing about meditation is um, it's not the amount of time. It's the, it's the actual content. Con- yeah. The content of it, you know? So what you want to do is you want to get distracted, you know, you mm-hmm. want to get, you want to have your mind drift off. Um, and that's How where you can realize. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's like that's the the where the real work is at. And and for me, like when I've been meditating, um, you know, for for days and weeks, like I'll be in a match and I'll be able to realize a lot faster that my focus is elsewhere. Um, mm-hmm. and I think that's that's the biggest uh help for meditation. And then visualization is all about like putting yourself in a position which you don't like to be in or that you're very good at depends whether you want to improve something or where you want to reinforce the things you do well. And then with the power, with the power of imagination, you kind of like put yourself in that position and, and just go through what you would normally do, you know? So like, for example, I would, I can put myself uh, on a break point, uh, saving a break point or having a break point and them serving at me to a, to a specific place. I don't like what am I going to do? Or maybe like, okay, I know that I'm, uh, good at doing this. Uh, let's say that it's just hitting the, the back and ball, you know? So you imagine yourself like coming in and, and not so just making things up. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> honestly, yes. Honestly, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, just putting yourself in those imagination and, and and imagining you're good. <laughs> I never thought of the like putting yourself in a position that you don't like. Like I've heard of visualization and stuff, but I to me it wasn't situational. It was more like I don't know if I'm visualizing a play, like a servant first ball, I would like visualize the whole play, but I'm not thinking I'm doing this at five six thirty forty you know what i mean like yeah i I've mean never look, actually put myself deep into the position of you know somewhere yeah. you don't want to be necessarily for me i remember uh the first masters i played uh was miami and i was playing the qualifying and they were doing the main draw ceremony at the same time and um then after the you know those 20 minutes of the ceremony uh, a band came out to play and I was playing on obviously one of the out outside courts and I was winning the match. I won the first set. I was playing uh, Safoyin. I was, a, I was a set uh, and p- playing pretty good in the second. And then the ceremony started occurring and then the band played. And I knew uh, most, or I have heard, I've had heard the songs and I was like, why is this distracting me so much? You know, why is this distracting me so much? And um, you know, you're not used to it. You're not used to playing, you know, those challenges or even 250 events with the band playing. And then the gondola at the Miami Open was going overhead. Um, and that was distracting. So I was just like, dude, I, I, I didn't know what was going on, you know? <laughs> and then I went and I put... I demand Madrid. to talk to the tournament director right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, went to Mad- I went to Madrid, uh, the Mutua, and the same thing happened there. And I started realizing, I was like, these, these bigger events are, um, are like, they're not tennis tournament. There's, they're like events, you know, they're, they're festivals. Yeah, like they're production. like, yeah. yeah. And, and same with the U S open, like U S open is extremely distracting. Um, so a lot of the vis- visualization I've done in the past hasn't even been about the actual tennis, you know, it hasn't been like saving break point or serving for the match or whatever. It's been like, 
imagining me walking out onto a court and someone is playing music or there is something else going on and you're just keeping your focus. Um, and that has helped me a lot because when, when you go and then you actually go on court and those things are happening, it's like you already went through them, you know? And are you doing this like during tournaments, like at night before the match, morning of, like how do you kind of time your, I guess your mental sessions, meditating and visualizing? Yeah. Um, I'm doing it like, it it varies because your your day varies so much uh when you're traveling you know whether you're playing first on or whether you're playing last on like it it it's about i feel like it's about just doing it you know because it's not if you wake like if you in my opinion if you wake up and you visualize it doesn't mean you're gonna win you know what i mean no it's it's yeah. the it's the work you've put in the last three months or the last Being six consistent months. With it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that you, that will help you with well, that will help you winning. Yeah. Well, let's lighten the mood a little bit. We have a question from your buddy Simon. He says, "How do you get the fattest forehand on tour?" <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, definitely working uh, working on your fitness i love doing fitness uh and i think just looking at the ball and hitting it like okay that's See, just, ball, hit ball. yeah that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's a that's a that's a uh, um something that is just addicting for me like just to hitting forehands with like a lot of spin and not even thinking about like the technique or anything you just like looking at it at the at the logo and and wishing that the logo is in there next time it comes around just peel you know? the logo it's off the ball. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, uh, then our boy our boy Chuchi had a couple for you he told me to ask you he told me a little story he said that you went through a breakup at, at some point and you turned to like a madman he started training like training like crazy is that true or were you always a break, that hard? a breakup uh I was just supposed just to lighten the mood. You're asking the man about heartbreak and it's supposed to lighten the mood. Nah, and break up. I don't know if it was a breakup, but it for sure it was like um yeah, it was it was it was a, a, a time when actually my coach like really used to trigger me. He was pretty smart at doing this because he would be like, um we would be training and he, and I'd ask him if I was to play you you were like back then you at my age and me at my age now who would win and be like oh i'd boost you you wouldn't you wouldn't get a game and i'm like yeah. what do you mean like and he, and then he'd be like well look at you you your fitness is is pretty pretty bad you get driven to practice um you you know you get dropped off by your dad you go home and then the next day i would come running to practice um Oh shit. Yeah. The next day, the next mm-hmm. day I would, I would run to practice and, and then I would, I would arrive like super sweaty and he'd be like, what did you do? And I like, I ran to practice and he's like, how long do you take? I was like 23 minutes. What? 23 minutes from your house. You should have done that. Uh, 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was just like a, a, a constant battle, you know? And, yeah. and like that really made me, uh, change um the mentality because you know i i always say that out of my three brothers i'm the worst in terms of genetics uh like both of them got the better of my parents and my fitness is just because i've worked really hard on it and and i enjoy doing it and and i have a my opinion a very good fitness coach that has helped me a lot so Chuchi, Yo, can you, talking, just can talking. you clarify yeah, talking <laughs> <laughs> can you clarify to me bro what's going on because you were born in new york but then when i played you in juniors you weren't were you playing for us or how did it work where are you from you were, yeah what's going on <laughs> i'm i'm from the dominican honestly i'm from the dominican republic <laughs> with chuchi i grew up with chuchi um yeah. no i was born in i was born in new york my parents were living there at the time um but both of my parents were spanish so um you know, at home I speak Spanish, um, and I grew you speak up in Dominican, Dominican Spanish. 
Yeah, I Domin- I I speak Dominican Spanish. Yeah, I, yeah. there was a <laughs> point in my in my life where I would because I went to school there for ten years, and we'd come back and I'd talk to my mom a certain way, and then I talked to my brothers in Dominican Spanish, and my parents yeah. were like, oh, "Dude, what's going on here? You know, like they can't be, they can't be talking they can't be talking like that." Um, yeah. <laughs> And then, and then I would come, I would go back to Spain in, in, uh, in summer, in summer holidays. And then I'd be talking to my uncles and aunts in Dominican Spanish. And they were like, no, these aren't, these aren't family, man. These, what are these kids? <laughs> Not my grandkids. <laughs> yeah. Tucci had one more. He told me there was something to do with dengue fever and a coma. Yeah, I was, uh, so I, I, this was last year. I, um. I had just finished the U.S. Open, probably the best uh, um, moment of my career. Um, I was 120, the highest rank, or 121, the highest ranking. And then um, I didn't have a single point to defend till the end of the year. Um, so I, I was going to play the challengers in the U.S. And between the first week of the U.S. Open and the challenger, I had like 10 days. And one of my best friends from childhood was getting married in the Dominican Republic. So she invited me to her wedding and I was like in New York, which is pretty close. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'll go to the wedding, which was that weekend. And then I'll train for a week there. And then I'll go, I'll come back to the U S. And so that's what I did. I went to, to the wedding and I, I had a really good week of practice. And then a day before leaving, I started feeling really bad, like really, really bad. Um, and I had a bunch of fever. It was 40 degrees Celsius. I don't know how much that is in, in Fahrenheit. Um, but I was, bo- I was, I was, ba- I was boiling. And, uh, my mom was like, uh, you gotta go to hospital. I'm like, no, I'm not going to, ho- to hospital. I think this is just that I've been spending too many hours under the sun because, you know, in summer in the Dominican, like it, the sun hits, you know? Yeah. Serious, and it's yeah. yeah serious so so i was just like that's just you know like an insulation or whatever like I'm, i'll be fine you know and then at 3 a.m I, I woke up like completely drenched and i was like okay I, I gotta go to hospital and i went to hospital and i was leaving the next day and then i get there and uh i was like i just need some pills i'm uh, feeling pretty bad and the doctor was like okay yeah sure so she gives me some pills and I'm about to leave. And she goes, no, no, don't, don't go. I, I just did a test on you. We're checking for, for dengue. And I grew up in, in the Dominican and I've been going there all my life. And I've, I know people have had dengue, but um, I've never, you know, it's, it's with the mosquito bite and I've mosquito. never had, um, you know, I've been bitten millions of times by mosquitoes and I've never had anything. So I was like, dengue, come on, like whatever, man. So she comes back 15 minutes later and she's like, yeah, you got dengue. And I'm like, okay, great. So what? Paracetamol? Um, Some she's antibiotics like, should be good to go. Sh- sh- you shouldn't. You shouldn't go home. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? I'm going. I'm leaving tomorrow to the U.S. to play. And she's like, no, no, no. You, you, you can't go home. And I'm like, I'm going home. Just paracetamol, right? Paracetamol and just rest a bit. And she's like, well, you, you shouldn't be doing this. So, anyways, I just went home. And two hours later, I was back in the hospital, like feeling worse than ever and i remember the doctor looking at me and she's like um yep i knew that was gonna happen and then she put me in in a in a um you know in a room and they can't give you anything so because all your blood red your red blood cells and your white blood cells diminish so like you're very prone to uh internal bleeding um and so so i was i was very bad I, i spent um 11 days and um i lost 12 kilos um and i couldn't they couldn't give me anything there i was just like uh getting paracetamol uh but didn't really do anything i remember the doctors would give me like a bag of paracetamol for like you know three four hours and I would change it myself. You know how in hospital you can change the how how quickly mm-hmm. the the drop goes down. Oh, the IV. And I would just like yeah, the IV. I would just like put it like full, you know. And You're I would a wild like, boy, go. Huh? <laughs> I would I would not be touching that shit. I would not be touching any of that shit. 
I would go through the I would go through the paracetamol bag like in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, like, and then I would, I was like, I need more, I need more. And they couldn't give me more, you know? Um, so it got pretty bad. And at one point, like, you know, they were doing a bunch of tests with me because if it goes, if it goes South, they got to put you in coma because they, um, they got to control your internal bleeding, quote unquote, you know? And mm-hmm um luckily i i never got to 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 that point but i was pretty close to it and and i was just like so so cooked like i couldn't move um and they couldn't get so no anything. coma no no coma no coma no coma just just be talking, bro. i gotta go to you after this i gotta go to Juicy's cat, bro. But but it, but it was but it was very it was very like looking back it was very um what's it called uh it was very dangerous like I didn't realize how bad I was you know and they yeah. after when they when they told me I could leave they 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 told me about all the cases that you know haven't made it you know and they're like mm. people just Scary. people die you know and I was like oh shit. You know, I was just treating it like as a fever, but it's, it's, it's pretty bad. And the cases are going up and up and up and, um, you can get back. Vac- well, you can get vaccinated, but it doesn't do anything. Um, Wait. and actually I was super, super grateful that I, that I, um, spent it in the Dominican Republic. Like people say, oh, you were in, you were in a hospital in the Dominican Republic for, for 11 days. And I'm like, yeah, but the, the thing is they see that they see those cases every day of the year, yeah. you know? So mm-hmm. they are so good at dealing with that. And they know exactly like when you're really bad and when you're, it's like a mild case. Um, and they, mm-hmm. they told me about a lot of tourists going there to Dominican, getting the dengue and going back to the U S and in the U S people give them antibiotics and, and they die. So I'm, um, I was super grateful to be there. And um, actually I knew like half of the uh, of the nurses and doctors because they were the fathers of um, schoolmates of mine when I used to go to school there. Oh, so funny. the treat the, I was I was getting treated so well and and they took such good care of me and um, yeah and I'm still like for me Dominican Republic's in my heart the people the country um, and everyone says like oh you you must not want to go back to the Dominican I'd go back tomorrow if I could. You know, mm. like that's that shit's not gonna change anything. That's what that's why I saw you for the first time. That's what we played in was it yeah eighteens? No, it's futures, right? Futures, I believe. At futures, futures, yeah. Yeah. Qualities. <laughs> Qualities, yeah. yeah. And then I lost to Chuchi the next day. <laughs> Chuchi was that's a crazy. baller, man. Chuchi was a baller. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Well, Chuchi's one no against me, so I can't talk any shit about Chuchi, so <laughs> all right but, to, um, to finish to finish up we got a quick game five questions you versus jody trivia geography tennis whatever oh god first person that it just you just answer first person to get it right um gets the point if you guess you're and it's wrong you have to wait till the other guy guesses then you can guess again and if we get a tiebreaker, we will count these five questions. So, yeah, five questions. First, the three, and then we're done here. We ready? All right. No. Make sure your make sure your Wi-Fi doesn't lag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No lagging. No lagging. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Here we go. Come on, Joey. Question one. What is the capital of Brazil? Brasilia. <laughs> yes. I know is it? Got no <laughs> yeah. No, no. I did. I did know. I did know. I didn't know because right. there's a challenge there. Yes. I was okay. taught this last year. There's a challenge at the end of last year. Okay. One zero. One zero. We got Nico up one. Only player to beat Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic in the same event. Uh, Nabandian. Nabandian. Two zero. This is a quick game. This is a quick game. All right, Jody, come on, dog. What's that? You're breaking Which up. Ma- <laughs> which which Masters 1000 was played on blue clay one year? Ma- Ma- Madrid, Madrid. Madrid. Ooh. That was so me, man. That was like 30 seconds before. But you said ma 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 and he just got it out. Ah, yeah, come it's on. true. It's I'm true. I did, come on. I did stutter. I'm going to get Jordy that one. Two one. Two one. All right. Two, one. 
Come on, fight, fight. Um, okay. Who won the end of year masters in 2009? No, why? The clue? The clue yeah, is... I, I got it, I got it, I got it. D Davidenko. Oh, yes. Three, what one. the hell? <laughs> what? <laughs> and that's it, folks. Wait, hold and on. That's well, a how did you know that? Bro, I know so many stats. It's crazy. You set me up here, Justin. You set me up. <laughs> <laughs> ask the next one. Ask the next me? one. Let's go. Okay. Okay, the next one is a spelling question. I'll let Jody spell it first. Never mind. No, it's all good. All right. All right um, yo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, we have Pro Stringer here. Um, $100 off if you use our code. We got some merch. And... Oh, yeah, we're in the hoodie. Yeah, bro. Yeah, I don't know which get you, get you a pink where, can get, where can get I get you. one of those? Uh, link is in the bio on the Instagram and YouTube. The link is in every single yeah. bio on every single description on every single. Somebody social buy video. something, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, Nico, thank you for taking the time out. I know it's late over there in, in London. Um, appreciate talking to us. It was a good conversation and good luck the rest of the summer. And good luck tomorrow night, most most importantly. Yeah, it's football, right? I think it's football. Yeah, football, football night. yeah. Big game. <laughs> Euros, <laughs> Euros. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, uh, thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure. Um, I'll do it any day. As I said, I, I really respect what you guys are doing. I think it's great. And I got a lot of um, a lot of respect for both of you uh, as, as people, as uh, tennis players, and as podcast creators. So, um, good, good luck for you guys. Um, we'll stay in touch. It's always a pleasure and, and I hope sure. to see you guys soon. There's a appreciate Hopefully the we person, in person one day. Yeah. We got yeah, a run one in person. Yeah. For sure. Right, yo, good luck. Thanks for coming. See you boys. Thank you. Peace. Appreciate it. Good night. <laughs>